Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to another roundtable discussion at the Brooklyn Museum. My name is Haley Graham, and I'm a fellow in the Public Programs Department here. Um, tonight's talk is being live streamed with the very generous support of the Photo Brigade in Adorama, so thank you to them. Um, we host these roundtable talks as a spotlight to our special exhibitions, and tonight our focus is Who Shot Sports? A Photographic History, 1843 to the Present. This show has been guest curated by the fabulous photographic historian Gail Buckland, who also worked with the museum in 2009 on the exhibition Who Shot Rock and Roll? Round of applause for Gail. A little on. <laughs> um, who Shot Sports is coming down very soon on January 8th. So tonight we're going to be hearing from world-renowned sports photographers Al Bello, Walter Yost, John Hewitt, and Simon Broody, moderated by Gail herself. Um, the panel tonight will be followed by a Q&A session, and afterward, we welcome you to enjoy the exhibition on the fourth floor for free by the generous courtesy of Canon, and we're very lucky that they did that for us. So a round of applause for Canon, seriously. Um, and then after that, please join us at 8.30 in the Who Shot Sports gift shop, also on the fourth floor, for a book signing with Gail. And it looked like a lot of people signed the raffle out front, but I just wanted to remind you that um, there is a raffle going on for a really nice Tenba bag um, by the auditorium entrance, if you want to sign your name in your email. So without further ado, I want to thank you all for coming, and I'm going to hand it over to Gail. Thank you. I, I want to double that thank you in this cold weather. Thank you so much for coming out, but it's going to be really warm and friendly and terrific, and I especially want to, want to thank these men on the panel. Um, when the athletes on the field or on the court are taking their shots, the photographers are taking theirs, um, to play and to watch and to photograph sports is to be fully in the moment and still photographers. These guys are masters of moments and when the action stops, the image remains. Uh, the finest sports photographers. And sitting on the stage tonight are four of the world's finest sports photographers. You could not get a better group. <laughs> I am so honored that they came, and I'm so delighted you've come to hear them. Um, they're documenting the front lines of human drama, preserving bodies in motion, giving shape to victory and defeat, and capturing the spirit, the nobility of sports. Um, their pictures are so beautiful so worthy of being in a museum that I, as a photo historian, I recognize there was a great gap in my field because you didn't find their work in the histories of photography. Their work is part of cultural history, art history, as well as sports history. Um, it's not easy to hear them talk, you know, they're all, telling their stories, but they're, they've been doing this for a long time, and it isn't an accident when they take one of these great pictures. They're professionals. They're as competitive as the athletes they photograph. They photograph people of every gender, every race, every nationality. I mean, they've covered the world um, because sports is universal and they have given an image to sports. Um, on my right is Walter Yost. Next to him is Al Bello, Simon Broody, John Hewitt. Um, they all sh shoot sports and they're all very different in many ways. They overlap in some. Tonight, we could, each of them could captivate you for a whole evening. Their pictures are so, yeah, you could. You could just show your pictures and tell Don't some exaggerate. stories. <laughs> but I want to do more than just 
show their pictures. I want to have a dialogue. I want them to speak about their field, about their pictures, um, to engage in dialogue. And we will have questions and answers afterwards, and then you'll be able to address your questions to them. So to begin with, um, uh, even the cover of my book was a competition. He won. <laughs> Who's he? Walter Yost. And I had so many photographers tell me, yeah, uh, yeah, he got the cover again, like 300 SI covers. Um, it's just too cool that I am sitting next to the great Walter Yost, who started in 1959. Um, I'm probably the second old. I am definitely the part. second oldest one on this panel. Um, <laughs> Who's first? <laughs> you beat up. Um, I, I, I don't want. You can go to their websites. They have fabulous websites. Walter's website has so many pictures, even ones he's taking now. I mean, it's constantly being updated. Um, in 1963, at the age of 19, uh, he was on the e Sports Illustrated masthead and had a cover. I mean, he actually shot for them when he graduated high school. Um, <laughs> that, that's pretty Thank impressive. Um, we were talking about 68 to 72. He photographed at Atlantic Records, but um, but I guess. You got out just in time. <laughs> I mean, every Super Bowl since the first one, and so much more. Um, OK, this is Walter. How old were you? Uh, this was taken last year. <laughs> uh, well, hey, I just want to thank everybody for braving the trip to Brooklyn tonight and coming here. And to let us talk to you and share our stories. We don't have all the answers, believe me. Uh, our son, who's in the front row, looks exactly like us here. This was, I think this was 1963. It was taken by a, a life photographer named Bob Peterson. And most of these cameras don't exist. That's an old Photon, the old Nikon Fs. And, uh, was it a problem buying them? No, it no. wasn't a problem. You, you had to pay for them like everything else. <laughs> they were the best cameras in the world, and uh, that's a long time ago. You look more like your son than this one. <laughs> well, it, this was taken in Los Angeles. This that monster round lens is a thousand millimeter lens. I, I don't want to get into technical problems, but this was this was probably the greatest lens of all time because what it did was isolate everything. A thousand millimeter depth of field is maybe an inch. So everything's out of focus behind or in front except what you shoot. So you're either in focus or 90% of the time you're out of focus. <laughs> but this is the way uh, we operated back then. Spot meters, a bunch of cameras, a lot of film laying around, boxes all over the sidelines. It really is a historic picture. Not oh, notice the film problem. guys. Notice the light meters. Um, I don't know. Who uses a light meter anymore? What? Oh, Do you use a light meter? What is it? I don't know. On my phone, I use my light meter. <laughs> it's an app. It's an app. This, this isn't Walter photographing. It's a character study. Well, this, this was taken on a swimsuit issue, so this was a plastic wave on the North Shore of Hawaii that we had posed the model in, and to make it look like water, we took a hose to spray water over the plastic wave so it looked like there was actually water dripping down. So that's my Kelly Slater imitation. <laughs> we'll, we'll be looking at his pictures very soon, but I want to introduce Al Bello. He has his, his fan group from Getty. In, in the audience, um, there's an old <laughs> there's an old expression by way Thanks, of Canarsie. Guys. He's he's by way of Canarsie. He is the only born and bred 
Brooklynite on the panel, and he's well, really well. happy to be at the Brooklyn Museum. <laughs> okay. okay, here's another one. He went to South Shore High School. Anybody? South Shore High School. <laughs> he's, he's, he's. He doesn't have a beard. How can you be from Brooklyn? <laughs> He also or hair. To, okay. He also went to Stony Brook. Anybody graduated from Stony Out Brook? Out in Long here? Island. Long Stony Island. Brook. It used to be. It used to be a really popular school. Everybody went there. Um, Al is sitting next to Simon. They both have similar histories and quite divergent ones. Here's a Brooklyn guy. He was born in England. They both worked for a phenomenal agency called All Sport, and I hope they'll be talking a little bit about just what that type of experience meant for them. But Al came to Getty via um, one course at Stony Brook, a lot of perseverance, um, doing odd jobs and shooting for Ring Magazine. Then he went to All, All Sport, which was at the time perhaps the world's they're going to say it was the world's greatest photo sports agency. And I, the the I only it, one. <laughs> it was really, really good. Um, and now Al is chief sports photographer for Getty North America. That's pretty prestigious. Um, and honestly, getting them, I mean, each of them flew in or, you know, was busy, except for some of the more elderly people, you know, who pick and choose, but you were photographing this weekend, right, you said? This past weekend? I was in Florida, too. Oh, I, was... I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. was I. I was in Florida, too. I was... yeah, but they were working, they were working. Um, Simon um, wanted to be a cricketer. He wanted to play professional cricket. He didn't, and as he said, he'd probably be serving coffee now if he had gone the route of being an athlete. Um, he wanted to be a gym teacher. Uh, that didn't happen because he had a summer job and he discovered all sport. And when you were, what, about 19, you started working for all sport in London. And really, um, w there was a discussion about, um, you know, having an assistant. These guys made tea and coffee and filed negatives and looked at transparencies and were allowed to take pictures and learn from the best. And um, that's the way they got to their eminent positions. John um, is, came from a different route. Um, he wanted to be an art photographer, as far as I could make out, but that was after he didn't know what he was going to do, and he saw the local photographer in his small town dr driving a Corvette. And you thought, if, yeah, that's a good reason. I'll be a photographer and drive a Corvette. Um, he, he also now does incredible um, work, both for the IOC, the Olympic Committee, and also does a lot of commercial work, which he's going to be talking about. Um, what he said to me when I interviewed him is, you know, Nike doesn't ask for much. They just want one photograph to sell a million shoes. Um, and his long list of clients. Okay, we are going to now, oh, you know something? I want to show the photographs because I forgot. Um, this is, wait a second, uh, um, let me just go back. Okay, uh, Al, <laughs> that's you. Who are you photographing? And uh, that's me and uh, my friend's pool, who's also a photographer, Bruce Bennett. He uh, let me go in his backyard, and I was just experimenting. He's an uh, up-and-coming boxer that I had some couple ideas uh, swirling in my head. And yeah, he gave me an afternoon, so uh, it was, you know, it was free, so I took advantage of it. Just a couple of years ago, just working on some pictures of, of this young guy, underwater and, and out of the water, just testing out new housing, so. 
Normally, he's like in full scuba gear, but not in this picture. No, no, it's a pool anchor. Oh, up there? No, that's a, that's a different story. That's in the Middle East somewhere, um, Qatar, I believe. And uh, yeah, it's just one of those things where I didn't want to be where everyone was. So I just climbed on the light pole. And, uh, and there I am. Yeah, just in my You're own world. crazy. All these around. guys, yeah. Yeah. There are not many rules in Qatar. You could do Whatever. for all you uh, aspiring to drink. No, well, depends what time and how you do it. <laughs> well, this photograph is by Simon, but when I saw it, I thought, this is a brilliant photograph, so I'm going to let Simon talk about it, but see if you can find Al. He's in the picture. He's in the yellow. He's <laughs> looking. <laughs> This is a, uh, a great picture. Oh, thanks, girl. Um, yeah, I took this as the end of the Mayweather um, Pacquiao fight. And uh, I got terrible photographs all through the fight because uh, I was in the wrong position. Uh, but I thought this one really summed it up because I spent a week with each of these boxers before this fight. And, uh, you know, they're just going behind the scenes. You know, that's one thing a sports photographer gets to do. And it's always amazing. We always see them in the, uh, you know, on the stage, earning all the hundreds of millions of dollars. But all the hard work that goes on behind, that's for me where the real photographs are taking place. Mm. And uh, I was with Pacquiao, and they were very nice, super respectful of me as a photographer. Then I went to Mayweather's gym. First, they wouldn't let me in the gym. And as I'm sitting there, waiting to get permission to go inside the gym without any cameras. Uh, I hear this commotion, and running past me is a guy being chased with, an, an, another guy's chasing him with a large knife. And that basically summed up how it was gonna go with uh, uh, May, Mayweather. And that's it, that's why I have this picture. <laughs> and did you have better luck, Al? Uh, me, no, it was a boring as hell fight. Uh, I'm in the back over there. In the back, over there, bald guy, up there, looking at the back of his camera, as we all do. Oh, there uh, you are. There's yeah. Beck. Yeah, Robert. And, uh, yeah, it was just a tough fight. They just didn't fight, really. I mean, one of the biggest pay-per-view fights of all time, and it was a bomb of a fight. So, um, yeah, not so great. Not so great. Uh, right. I, I also put this in just to show the scrum. I mean, how, they, how the photographers have to fight for positions and... You know, no matter how famous you are, you're still... Yeah, I was at another Pacquiao fight um, where he got knocked out, and um, his corner was devastated, and as I was taking pictures, they, they attacked me. They jumped over the ring and punched and kicked and ripped my shirt, and, and I had to jump off the ring. It was a whole scene. Uh, I should have showed you those pictures. Um, but <laughs> Did you earn money? <laughs> I earned my money that day, yeah. That was, uh, that was a tough day. Um, but that's how it goes, you know. It's just it's one, you know, one day you're out of the action, and one day you're right in the middle of it. So uh, you well, can't avoid it sometimes. I, I, mean, I think it's an important. That the other thing about it is, is what Al is mentioning. If the event, it, you know, sometimes you don't get any great action photograph just because, not because of your own fault as a photographer, but sometimes the event doesn't lend itself for you to actually make a wonderful action photograph. Um, you know, you always expect, and the lead up to this fight was huge, and everybody was expecting a great fight, and it turned out to be a complete dud, as the photographs were as well. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, you're all invited to see the exhibition afterwards, and what you're going to see are not the most famous photographs in sports history. You know, the greatest touchdown or the, you know, amazing dunk. But you'll see more pictures like this, things that give the flavor. I mean, there are plenty of famous athletes in the show, but I just respect the um, other view of sports that doesn't always get published, doesn't always get appreciated. And here's, here's Simon uh, <laughs> working. Sorry, it's a little... I think this was Instagram, off Instagram or something, but... It was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, me. Okay, sorry. That's me again. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, uh, Michael Phelps. I did a 
a portrait shoot with the three athletes in Rio. Um, yeah, what else can I tell you? It was quick. <laughs> That's me getting in the way of the remote cameras and me being in field at the Olympics. Uh, and, you know, working in field at the Olympics is, a, you know, really actually a special position. There are only 16 photographers allowed in the infield. Uh, I've got to tell you, I have a love-hate relationship with it. You know, it's great in one way. You get a lot of freedom, um, but there's a lot going on. And, you know, you can get hit by the discus and the, and the javelin. Those things make it a really bad day. Um, I, I don't think I said that for many, many years, um, Simon, just like... Walter photographed for Sports Illustrated, and we have a nice contingent from Sports Illustrated here. Um, so I guess you got this position because you're a Sports Illustrated photographer, right? No. Oh, no? Yeah, I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm still learning, folks. Okay. Um, here, it could be Al, but it happens to be um, John shooting underwater. Was it a commercial shoot? It's the hairline that confuses everybody. <laughs> Yeah, this was a, a shoot for, um, for Power Aid for, before the London Olympics. Uh -huh. uh, this is a Canadian swimmer. Um, I'm in shooting in conjunction with television. So above the water, there's 90 people with television cameras and everything else. And usually what happens on, on TV shoots, because I'm coming from a completely different angle than these gentlemen because I'm in the commercial world and I, once in a while I play in, in this world. But um, we get maybe at the end of the day or when they're changing a lens, you might get two minutes to work with the athlete or you get 15 minutes at the end of the day. Um, so in the meantime, instead of me sitting around, I try to get as much photography done as I possibly can and then all of a sudden, there's an underwater microphone there and a speaker, and I'll hear John back up. Yeah. And then the, the motion camera comes into the water, and I have to stop. And that's what that was from. And this is from? This is from last week. Last week on a shoot. You yeah, know? This, is, this is, again, we're sh this is in Vancouver. Um, why somebody wants to shoot surfing in Vancouver at this time of the year, I'm not sure. But uh, this is also in conjunction with a television shoot. And the reason I sent this picture is because there's, we had only about seven hours of daylight from sunset to sunrise, sunrise to sunset. And the television crew had everything. They, they were in control of the shoot. It was this woman surfer right here. And the second that this, it was a beautiful sunny day, but the second the sun disappeared behind the cloud, which looked like for the day, they said, okay, sprint's turn. Go ahead, we're done. We, so I have, I have no sun. It's going down. I have about an hour before there's no sun at all. And I have a $4,000 a day drone team who... Drone. Drone, a helicopter thing, um, who can't get it to work. And I have a client staring at me saying, we need this overhead shot. So this is my handheld drone shot. <laughs> this is like, come up with something fast, put a 14 millimeter lens on and start walking <laughs> as deep as I can into the water. Okay. So this can I add something about yeah, TV and still shoots? Sure. Since you do both, yeah. the still photographer is always like the bastard child on these oh, shoots. Oh, yeah, you're, you're the second you person. Are, so. You might as well be in a corner because they really don't want you there, but they have to have you there. And you get no time except when they don't need it. So it's a very hard job to do in many ways because you get no time. Mm -hmm. And... And, and, You're a stepchild. And, and, and the agency doesn't look at you any differently. I mean, it's, there, I've been on jobs where it's 14 or $15, $15 million media buy for the print ad that I'm supposed to get in a minute and a half when, I, when they're deemed me mm -hmm. socially accessible to go out there. Yeah, John. I, I think we should discuss that people think you have a lot more time. When you look <laughs> at pictures, you, know, you look at pictures, it's, it's nice and slow, everything's stopped here. I mean, for instance, with Phelps at the Olympics, to get three people gold medalists, how much time do you have? They're whisked in. Everything's like this. I mean, you happen to have a relationship with Phelps, but everything's like this. It's just in and out. You know, people think you have an hour with someone. Maybe you have five minutes. I've had two minutes on a stopwatch. 
I've had 60 seconds on a stopwatch with athletes. But that's almost part of the fun. <laughs> it's can the you do it in 60 seconds or can you do it in seven minutes? And can you do something that's going to be better than anybody else's photograph well, I, I, and more I, I, memorable? Part of the way, I think it's almost part of the game. Right. I, I sort of enjoy it. Like if you get an athlete and you've got seven minutes, seven and a half minutes like with Tiger in three poses, I'm on the clock. I'm out of there in seven minutes because you always want to beat them. It's a game. So it's a game between the athlete and the photographer. And once with Tiger, you know, everything's fast in the seven and a half minutes. So how do you slow a situation down? So when Tiger arrived, you know, the hug, how are you doing? And I started to talk very slowly and bring it down. Then I said, I want to show you what we're going to do. And instead of showing him some tests we did the day before, I showed him some swimsuit pictures. So I took him off his game. It was something like, oh, do you know so-and-so? So now I knew I had him. You he got shoots it. the swimsuit issues. Uh, that was a, that's a good card for the athlete. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, and now we're going to take a look at some photographs that probably took less than seven seconds to take. Um, these are. I'm going to ask the three of them, um, after Walter talks briefly about each picture and tells you what they are, which ones they wish they had taken. Um, so. What an embarrassing question. <laughs> and later we're going to see Walter's um, Michael Jordan. I've grouped those later on in the series. So Walter, I love it, but what is it? Well, this is a... Uh basketball in the 60s. This is, I mean, maybe the greatest rivalry in the history of basketball. As teams, the Celtics versus the Philadelphia 76ers. That's Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain. This is 1967. This is a long time ago. But this is the mecca for basketball. Boston, I think, has always been a very special place for sport. You know, it's a, a very small city possessed with its teams, New England and the Sox. Very special town, and this, was a, this is what they call a tip-off. This is the beginning of a game in and 1967. And it's gorgeous. <laughs> and I just respond to these as pictures because I don't know very much about sports, but it's gorgeous, um, and I love this one. It's the cover of my book. Well, there's one thing that you know makes these interesting outside of the moment. This is a long time ago. Also, is and I know a friend of ours has talked about this. When you used to go to arenas, smoking was allowed. So the whole arena was full of smoke. So it's now on TV, you see smoke machines creating this <laughs> hazy light. This was the light you had all the time. And you used to put your strobes not in the ceiling. I used to bring them myself, and you put them in the mezzanine so they were low. So it was more theatrical lighting than this overhead light that you're forced to do in a lot of arenas now. And this was taken with a Hasselblad, you know, on Kodachrome, I guess. Ektachrome, I imagine. Hmm. Wow, celestial. Oh, I paired these together. Oh, uh, well, they, these are both in the 60s, 67. And this is the first game I ever went on the sidelines of a football game. Hmm. And I, I, my team was Baltimore. I didn't grow up in Baltimore, but I always loved the Colts. And I was very nervous, and there used to be a program on TV called Pro Football Highlights every Thursday that I watched religiously. And so I wore all khaki clothes in case I could see myself on the replays on Pro Football Highlights on Thursday at 7.30. So after he made this catch, which was maybe as far as John and I are away, I jumped up in the air and leaped on his back as of the Colt fans. <laughs> And of course, next week, they showed it. And as soon as I came off his back, they edited it out. So I, I succeeded in a strange way. And the reason he bobbled the ball is his pinky fell under the ball. Oh. Aren't you glad he came out on a cold night? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, well. Well, this was in the World Series in 67, one of these things you know, that you never see happen again. A guy sliding, that's Kurt, uh, Kurt Flood in the background. He's going back to first base. 
This is a slide in the home where you see the ball coming in from the outfield. You know, you talk about milliseconds. Maybe this was four frames a second. The odds of four frames getting the ball on these two guys on a motor is minuscule. I mean, but this is how pictures are taken. I mean, you're not planning this to happen. Things happen. All of us just work in the moment most of the time. It's not like you're planning ahead for five years from now. It's yeah. the next job is always what's most important, right, guys? I mean, <laughs> right. Sports photographers are very in the moment. Well, anyone recognize this guy? O.J. Simpson. This is his last college game. They're retiring his jersey, USC, UCLA, in California. So the jersey in his hand was being retired. This is his last college game in 1967, when he was still, you know, a god. I mean, I see these as incredible contributions to the history of photojournalism. I, I mentioned before cultural history. I mean, they're so rich as images. And yes, they're also about sports, but they're about so much more. Well, these are, well, certainly two of my favorite athletes of all time. I'm, I'm going to say Jack, I, I love, but Arnold Palmer, who recently passed away, and Joe Namath. Um, let's start with Namath here. Once again, if he had lost the Super Bowl, this picture would have meant nothing. Another photographer, Neil Leifer, who's a friend of ours and a, a photographer for years, was given the best assignment. He was assigned to the Baltimore Colts, which they were supposed to win the Super Bowl. I was assigned to the Jets, so like a bad, bad assignment. So Joe would hold court at the pool. This picture would have meant nothing if they lost. You know, it's, it's, no one plans this. I don't even remember shooting it, actually. And Palmer and Nicholas, I was invited to the clubhouse, half a roll of film. I was just led in there. I was following Palmer around. They sat down. They were smoking. I took 20 pictures, and it was over. I mean, I didn't plan on going this room. Yeah, but both of them have become iconic, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about what that means later. Um. Well, I, I, this, is, this was taken in Miami. I always think of Miami as colorful. This is the great Dan Marino, one of them. Great well, quarterbacks came out of Pennsylvania playing for the Miami mm -hmm. Dolphins. I mean, but now you see a lot more color uh, because of digital. I mean, this must have been quite remarkable when you did it. I mean, well, the sign behind me was remarkable. I was very <laughs> concerned with backgrounds in any picture I take. So mm -hmm. this was taken with that massive thousand millimeter. Oh. So I stationed myself in the end zone and shot, hoping I could get something to take mm -hmm. place in front of that sign. So you're going to throw away 90% of the game, but maybe something happens in front of it. So I think you have to take chances to take pictures. I mean, you go to a game, but you're going to throw away 50% of your take, maybe more, if you go to a game, maybe 90%. You're looking for one picture. I mean, that's the way I always think of a job, to get one good picture out of there. It really doesn't matter. If you can take one great picture, then it's a success. But that's, uh, I've always felt that way when you go into jobs. Yeah. Well, we're going to, maybe I'm going to move a little quicker yeah. because um, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance. <laughs> um, one of the things Walter always says is, you know, he loves photographing kids playing, and he loved playing stickball by himself. Here you have Cuba, and I'm not sure where the Brazil. South Brazil. Brazil. Uh, it's, um, that's, that's where we all came from. Mm -hmm. Anyone like sports started with those mm -hmm. kids. I mean, that's the first people I photographed. I was so young. I, who else was I going to shoot but my friends? So, yeah. Um, total access with kids. Uh, this isn't upside down. He wants it this way. Uh, uh, we finally have Serena. We're going to see quite a few of her. Um, and who's on the left? Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. It took him about four seconds to take his shirt off. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Your Honor, sir, this was taken on the giant 20 by 24 inch Polaroid camera. You know, oh, you, you, beautiful. I mean, the greatest camera of all time. And Walter, and so, Walter likes Polaroids at any size, he was telling me. But any size Polaroid. Yeah. Did you have more than? This was part of the seven minutes and 30 seconds, by the way, with Tiger Woods. <laughs> it's monumental. This was situation two. Really good. And? <laughs> Kobe and Shaq. You can see they're really enthused about the shoot, <laughs> as, as most athletes are. OK, John, which one do you wish you had taken? And all of them? If I if I leave one out, that's, I don't want to insult him. No, 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 I just want one. And why? I, I you have to go back through them all over again. <laughs> okay, Simon. <laughs> They're good. Uh, I, I think all of them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> I mean, you know, I just, I think Walter had a style and, you know, that's, you know, the way he dealt with the athletes. It wasn't just the photographs he was taking. I mean, I, 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 these three gentlemen right here, I've been following their work forever. I mean, I've been following Walter since I got my first Sports Illustrated when I was probably six. And he's already in it. So it, this, is, this is, to me, I'm sort of like everybody here, only with a better seat. So I'm just. <laughs> wait, wait till you see some of his photographs. You're gonna, it's undue modesty. Well, it, so it, it, all of these. Any, well, again, and once in a while, Walter and I would bid on jobs together, against each other. And I would get a couple, he would get a couple, and I, I know that I always would look at it and be like, damn, I wish I, I, wish I could have got that job. Or wish. And, and it's that way with any photographer I've known, is I, I see photographs, I just, I wish I could get them, but that's not my vision either. So it's, it, it's like, I, I love all these photographs, and they're Walter's photographs. I, I and I, I would I would probably go into that room and and take those two, if I was asked to do the same thing right after Walter with the same thing same background same camera mine would be different I don't know if it'd be better or worse but it would be different you, you guys are very practical this is an imaginary <laughs> Al it, do you wish that one of these was in your court um, there's actually a series you didn't show I would take seri your series on Cuba, when you went to shoot the Cuban athletes, not just that one picture, but that whole series was uh, one of my favorite series of photos I've ever seen. And uh, you didn't show any of your Thai uh, kickboxing when you, when you did that. He, he sent them. I didn't put yeah, them in. Yeah, it out. I oh, see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's opinions, right? Uh, but uh, you didn't show it, but I would have I said those two things would have been two things I would have loved to have had a crack at, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then one singular photo. Um, you didn't show it either, but uh, Jordan with the towel, I just think that's one of oh, my favorite okay. we'll, we'll portraits, of, portraits of all time. But probably um, not with the towel, I don't think. Okay. Uh, so that's what, my true honest, that's what <laughs> okay, I think. Okay, well, yeah. here's something to compare. Um, in my research, they're both called the catch. Um, does that, can there be two catches? Um, so Al and Walter talk about what makes for an iconic picture, and these are both really iconic. You're really showing those side by side. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you a story. I was 11, maybe. I was just telling Walter this, and I was, you know, like John getting Sports Illustrated, and I remember when that happened, <clears throat> and I was a kid. It was like 81, maybe, right? Uh, I saw that on the cover and I went, oh, I just saw that on TV. That's, uh, it's inspiration right there, you know. And all these years later, look, I mean, we're sitting here talking about the picture on the right, the picture on the left. It's just, it's a little too crazy for me right now. Yeah. Uh, Isn't it nice to see year, grown right? men like, two, two, act two, like two, little two, kids? Yeah. Um, Your picture's pretty good. Uh, okay. I, it's really good. I put it in my Whatever, book. I'm just, you know, having a lot of time right now. But uh, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Walter. <laughs> uh, well. What do you see? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, listen, I saw this game on TV. I mean, I, I love watching pro football. And there were a hell of a lot more photographers at this game than the San Francisco-Dallas game in 82 with a yeah. lot of cameras. Uh, but 
I mean, you talk about milliseconds and focus and, and, and where you are and how things happen to come in front of you. I mean, you could have been somewhere else and the picture hasn't happened. This is, this is the luck of the draw. There. Yeah, it's, it's funny. The old saying, chance favors the prepared man. So he was ready for this, and then it happened. Yeah, well, the thing was, I mean, the only reason I was there in that position was because at Giant Stadium, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of people here in New York, uh, anyone who's gone photographed there, uh, MetLife Stadium is probably one of the worst stadiums to try and take pictures in um, for a lot of reasons, two being that on each side of the sidelines, there are um, scoreboards that run from the 30 to the 30, and they're bright and they're neon, and it's almost impossible to shoot side to side on, uh, on that field without getting this massive LED scoreboard in the background that runs across your picture. So I tend to spend a lot of my time in the end zone. Uh, it's one of the cleanest spots to work with background wise where there aren't yellow coated security guards or other photographers or um, you know, random hangers on just being on the sideline. And as Walter said, these days, we were talking before, when you got that picture in the late 60s, when your first game, how many people was on the sideline? Think about it. Not too many, right? Nowadays, it's just... It was like an empty sideline. Yeah, he's saying it's an empty sideline. So, it's... Empty um, sideline. That was the reason I was in that corner. Um, it was clean. Uh, I knew Beckham was up and coming. Uh, they were having a hard time keeping up with Dallas. They were went to their passing game. I stayed in the end zone at the 50, and he launched a bomb to, uh, to Odell Beckham. And um, he, had, he had just started coming on in his rookie year, making some nice catches. And, you know, like Walter said, right place, right time. So there we were. Yeah. Okay. A, a, a few, uh, three photographs now that you shot of Serena. I think I've, I told you this before, but, I mean, I don't know if you guys agree with me, but she is uh, one of the greatest uh, athletes to photograph on this planet Earth. You know, regardless what you think of her off the court, I mean, people out in the audience who have photographed her, us up here, uh, there is nobody who's as emotionally wonderful who spreads the court like she does that can stretch from side to side and beautiful hair and backlit pictures and expressions and tantrums and um, action and dives and screaming and yelling and it's it's endless oh there see uh, <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's every time almost you know it could be a first round match it could be the grand slam final it's she's serena williams is spectacular and i um really be sad when she leaves tennis but these are so sculptural the light on her well i mean but as we move into like i'm sitting between you know, two people who I, I, you know, I, I looked up to and learned from, you know, Simon especially, uh, just watching his work and the way uh, his style and the style how I grew up in uh, sports photography is how I try to apply it to this day. Yeah, they're beautiful. Um, and here, just... Oh, that. Um, I, that was my night off at the Olympics. Uh, I, um, <laughs> I uh, f just finished swimming. I was doing eight days of swimming and... I think I had to do something, oh, was, we did Phelps, uh, we had to do a portrait shoot with Michael Phelps, I think, um, he's doing it for Sports Illustrated, did it for Getty, <clears throat> and then I had the time to myself, and I thought, well, I haven't seen the track yet, let me, let me just go see uh, what it's all about, and I just worked my way around the finish, and I knew there was a lot of celebrations just past the finish, and these just had the 4 by 100s and the, the girls beat the Jamaicans, yeah. and um, it was one of those moments, you know, where I just looking again, I was just looking for a clean spot to shoot into, and they stopped and looked at the scoreboard, and there's been a lot of, of those kind of photos, but this, I was pretty happy, it was kind of yeah. clean, and it was a nice little moment. It was there, and then it was gone. It was just you, like that. You can see I'm pushing women athletes right now, because, yeah, they're four guys, and that, that's also a question you can ask later. Um, but here we have John photographed, John did a, a very beautiful book and exhibition on um, street basketball, all in black and white, and I often, he shoots color too, obviously, but um, he has a great affinity for black and white, and Simon's picture is so much about color. Also. I normally don't like when you decapitate a woman, but there's just, 
it's, there's a lot of history. Edward Weston did it all the time, lots of photographers did, but there's so much expression in her hands, I actually don't mind. But here you have the same subject, and maybe Simon, tell me why you photographed in this way, and John, why you photographed in that way. Same, is, um, same athlete, amazing. Simone I mean, for Bass. me, it was, you know, Walter talked about it a little earlier, you know, trying to figure out, I, I, you know, I was, I was trying to get all three athletes, Phelps, uh, Ledecky, and Biles together, and we were waiting on Phelps to show up. So I was just trying to, I was trying to keep everybody busy. That's really what it came yeah. down to. But you're happy with it. I mean, it's a great picture. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I mean, the one thing, I mean, yeah, as a photographer, you know, it doesn't matter if you shoot white, black, orange. You don't ever think of any of that when you're, when you're photographed. Female, male, I mean, I never, it doesn't cross my mind. I'm just looking for one great photograph. Mm -hmm. Does it cross your mind, John, if you're photographing a woman athlete or a male athlete? Well, I, no, I, I mean, I, it's not that I treat anybody differently. Um, I think that, that female athletes, um, to me, have there's a deeper sort of feeling to them when, when, uh, uh, that you don't get from men. Men tend to be a little more guarded, and uh, the women seem to be a little more emotional. Um, and I think you can, if you can drag that out of them, that's great. Um, the thing with this photograph, this was um, for Kellogg's, this is for a cereal box. Oh, not, really? Not, not, not that photograph. Oh. Um, I had the luxury of spending four hours with her doing all this stuff. Um, but the one thing, and these guys all know that, that, especially nowadays, that athletes are really guarded. They, they try not to show themselves. They'll come and they'll do what you want to do and smile when you want them to smile. But to try to get sort of just a, something that's a little more real, it's, it's tougher. And so this is in between takes. This is when the agency's looking at the monitor and um, deciding which one they like. The, the actual shot is her jumping on the balance beam. And this is so the two of us are sitting there, the, the monitor's behind me, and I'm, I'm just waiting for them to say, you know, shoot more, shoot less. And same with her. And this is when I took the picture. Mm -hmm. um, because again, this was a very unguarded moment, I think. Mm -hmm. And then as far as black and white is concerned, that's when I'm doing my, my edit, my retouching. This just, I think, felt so much better in black uh, and white because so there's so the, much color uh, around the, the, her uniform. Is that bright? Is that as red as the one over there on the other picture? Mm. Thanks. Okay, here's two. I mean, one of the sections in my exhibition is called Vantage Point. It seems to be a critical issue in sports photography, where you physically stand, where you have your camera, and these are... I think these are pretty self-explanatory, so I think we'll move on. Um, Simon's on the left from the, which Olympics? Sorry. Which Olympics? Uh, it, it's from uh, Sochi, so, first uh, women's ski jump. And this is also women's Canadian hockey. Do you, At Vancouver, yeah. Van but the, the one thing I want to say about that particular huh? photo is this was the first day that I shot hockey. I put in the remotes on both, over top of both goals went down and shot, and shot the game. Uh, the, at the beginning, both teams were huddled around their, their goal, so mm -hmm. I shot that. And then for the rest of the game, every time there was action near the goal, I shot it mm -hmm. as much as I could. Yeah. And hockey is constant movement. When you're mm -hmm. shooting it, it's, it's so fast. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was very excited to see what I got because there was a lot of action. And <clears throat> in the time I put them up and the time I went and sat in my position, I miss misjudge which remote was firing. So I have this photograph right here, and I have the other team around their goal, and I have about 600 photographs of a goalie standing by themselves watching <laughs> what's going on at the other end. Oops. <laughs> and, 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 you know, yeah, actually. Sometimes it's luck. <laughs> <laughs> that, that we could call that luck or bad luck. Um, but I do want to say, Simon, there are art photographers, you know, big name art photographers who have photographed a picture very similar to yours, but their intention was the museum wall. Their intention was a gallery. They shot thinking about how to hang that picture. And I assume more or less all of you shoot, maybe John not so much, 
always for the magazine page or for what Al calls the machine. <laughs> um, but aesthetically, I mean, these are right up to what I see in museums. Um, but you're I can say that's something I think that all of us, whoever we're mm -hmm. working for, mm -hmm. you have to shoot for yourselves. And no matter what assignments being given to you, you know, people hire you to do a certain thing, but when you get there, they want something else. And I think it's always important, you know, I've told our, our son who's a photographer, you have to shoot for yourself. If you take a picture that you think is good, then you may have done something. And that's what they really want in the end, is for any photographer to bring what you can give to a situation to that final set of pictures. Remember that. Yeah, I mean, I, the thing is, you know, obviously, I, I worked at Sports Illustrated for a while, and there's two director of photographers from the magazine in the, in the crowd there. And they were always, they, they understood how you had worked as a photographer. The art department didn't. They wanted to sort of formulate the photograph before you actually got there. And so they had these great ideas, and you'd get there, and there'd be no room to shoot anything. So, I mean, I think you, you always listen to what you know, as, as Walt said, the client wants, but then you're the person on the, on the ground and you should be shooting for yourself. Yeah. I think 90% of the time, what they expect never takes place. Right. And I'm glad when yeah. a client is on the shoot to see the disaster that's taking place in yeah. front of your eyes. <laughs> right. Because you know what? They don't want to hear it. I mean, we could go on all they day. The they they don't shoots. want excuses. No, but they're very the way, they're, happy to have great photos. <laughs> there is no excuse. That's yeah. the bottom line. You have to show up with a picture. Um, John, these are just a series uh, from your extensive shooting, and it's it's just maybe it's the antithesis of the swimsuit issue. John, you you photograph very kind of direct, you know, um, behind the scenes pictures. <laughs> well, this, this is um, a Canadian speed skater. This is in uh, Sochi. Um, mm -hmm. My job at the IOC is a little bit different than what Simon does at the Olympics, um, is that I have to, uh, along with capturing whatever action I can do, um, I need to capture sort of the whole environment so you see the whole world of the Olympics. So I get access to go into some training areas that other people mm -hmm. don't get allowed or allowed to, or I have other connections um, through the Olympic, the Canadian Olympic Committee, because um, the short track speed skaters to me are fascinating. Um, and so I got to spend a little time during their practice and then afterwards they sat for me. And again, this was all of three or four minutes so you have to you don't have really time to kind of think about like well maybe if i moved her to a slightly different spot this is where she was taking off her shoes so mm -hmm. i have to kind of work with what that was um but again i wanted i didn't want her to sit there and smile at me because this is the strength in her eyes to me is what what says everything about the photograph um i, I mean the other thing i want to say is that you know i myself and walter we you know we have incredible luxury just wandering around trying to come up with a different photograph. I mean, if you're working for a newspaper, I mean, you've got to come up with a very different photograph. You know, it's, it's kind of, uh, I don't know if I could do that. You know, I, I wanted to try and shoot from a different angle. Mm -hmm. And Sports Illustrated always wanted you to sort of pursue that. And sometimes you'd miss, you know, a great action photograph, somebody crossing the line because you were doing something else. Because I was wandering yeah. around elsewhere. Keep that thought, Al. We'll be asking you about. <laughs> so here. It's a whole, it's a whole party at Getty. Yeah. Here, there's a, a, one of your Olympic photographs on the left. And I'm just, I'm going to show these two. And then I'm going to also show these two. And just, I, I'm going to just ask one question, John. The, Shooting sports, you know, for the Olympics, does that, how does that inform your commercial work? I mean, well, actually, let me back up. Tell, tell us about your first use of real athletes in commercial work, because this, this is important, because before John started shooting for Reebok, yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of different their hands but and, and that that story is probably better with the the soul of the game photos but um 
the, the, the thing about me is that my commercial work affects what I shoot um, at the Olympics, not the other way around. Um, mm. I, 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 I gain a lot of knowledge about myself from shooting at the Olympics because you shoot 28 days of nonstop shooting all day long. You learn about what you can do, what you can't do, what to look at, what you mm. see. Um, but I try to bring um, what I do commercially into that world and okay. so, not the other way around. Okay. Okay, this is a series that really knocked me out. I hadn't seen it before. Um, these are Simon's photographs from the Paralympics. I think, Simon, I'm just going to go through them and then go back so people get a feeling for this body of work. go back now. Um, talk about it a little bit. I, th I think they're remarkable. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the one's a studio portrait. Obviously, I did a series of images earlier in the year, uh, and it was USOC would bring the Paralympians together and also the Olympians together in like a, a, a media scrum. Uh, Sports Illustrated has its own little studio where I was shooting from. And so I had a mix. I had the able-bodied, and then I'd have the Paralympians. The Paralympians were, were much better to photograph. They were into being photographed, uh, way more enthusiasm. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, I, all of them across the board were, were interesting to photograph. Mm. And then I went to the Paralympics uh, at the end of the year. And I'd never been to a Paralympian, uh, Paralympics before. You know, it was... Um, it was I'd been to the Rio game, so I was going back, so it was great to have the knowledge of the same uh, you know, stadiums and where not to get mugged. Um, but again, you know, the enthusiasm for the Paralympians uh, is, is pretty amazing to see. The one thing I didn't think about, there are so many different categories for everything. I mean, just to give you an example, 100 meters in the Olympics, men's and women's, there's uh, probably seven seven or eight races. Uh, Paralympics, there's about 300, 100 meter races. Lots of different categories. Um, and it was, it was uh, you know, definitely an experience. Powerful. Really powerful. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, you know, if I had a hangover, you know, there was people who had it worse that day than me, you know, mm -hmm. so I definitely, yeah, uh, I was focused. Yeah. Well, I just chose these two, but one of the things I keep on seeing, whether it's Walter or John or Simon or Al's pictures, the way they use shadows, I mean, really dramatically. Um, and these are just two really good examples of, you know, that you can only, I, I mean, I wrote about one of Walter's pictures, his famous blue dunk, as if, you know, it's a Sistine Chapel that Jordan seems to be playing with his shadow, but certainly, Aesthetically, I think all of you have mastered the art of shadows as, you know, better than any, you know, other group that I know of. Um, Al, here's a series of your pictures um, selected just because I like them so much. But <laughs> do you want to... How many, how many frames did you get like this? I mean, what are the odds of this? Yeah, that's a one. one. I mean, it doesn't even look real. It was a remote, but I set it up. It was one of those things we were talking about before uh, where we almost want to go back to smaller events. This is uh, an event that they don't have anymore down in Florida, and it's um, low-key, real low-key, but still world-class divers come. And uh, it's just, I love, would love to go down, and, and, I, and I get down there and just every idea in my head I would try and uh, implement. And so... Um, just set up a remote uh, on the 10 meter board and had them, you know, this is an, part of the event, you know, and had, I had a lot of people spin through, but these guys just spun the right way. Uh, and, and the clouds helped. Clouds, <laughs> weather, really? sun, yeah. But the shapes, the shape. and it's what we've never, what great sports photography does 
also shows us what we could never see with our naked eye. Well, it's a, it's a blank, you know, especially when you're doing remotes, you know, in John's picture, and uh, I mean, Simon's done a billion remotes, and Walt, I mean, we've all done it, but you have to, you gotta see it in your head first, what you think's gonna happen, <clears throat> and hope it happens, you know, uh, and a billion things could go wrong. Remotes don't fire, television interference, you forget to turn the camera off. Uh, I'm not the, the remote on, I've done it, I've shot on the wrong channel. You buffer your disc, when the film days you run out of film. You know, it's just anything can go wrong. Um, but and it didn't that day, right. so yeah, so thank goodness for that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's one of many head-ons of Michael uh, that, that I've done over the years. The difference is it's the first heat of a, must have been a semi or a final because that's when the water's most still. Uh, and that's what you really need when you're shooting head-on stuff. The water's like glass. And uh, when you're going through all the heats, the water churns up, the water churns up, and is, it doesn't have that, that sheen like it does before a final or a semi. Uh, so that's, that's the idea behind trying to get that. And I'm not, I'm not far from the, the first one to do that. So I, I just learned from watching and uh, observing a lot of the time. Oh, that was a picture of the Jets won a big game. And... Um, uh, they were interviewing Fitzpatrick, uh, and all the photographers w was in the front. Um, and I actually learned from a lot of things from Simon. One of the things he always told me was walk away from the pack, see what you can do away from from everybody else. You know, the, and I think you told me, the, don't be a sheep, be the wolf, something like that. <laughs> I remember it like like yesterday. So, uh, oh, other thing for squeezes in, uh, he told me. Um, I don't mean to embarrass you, but uh, on, right. too bad I'm doing it anyway. Six Ps. Proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. <laughs> he told me that. So but you have uh, to say it with a British accent. Uh, proper preparation. <laughs> sound like Dick Van Dyke, right? Proper preparation. a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. <laughs> so, a good master of alliteration. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, that's when Jeter broke his, leg, uh, his ankle in uh, the playoffs. It was a big deal. The Yankees went right down after that. Uh, it was a big play. It was one of those things that you just, you're on it. You know, the, it was a grounder. He stepped wrong. He fell. He still tried to make the play as, as, as he would do because he's such a, a great player. Uh, but he, he broke, his, broke his leg that day, um, his ankle, actually. Yeah. yeah I, I just like the angle so much. I didn't know the story. Yeah. Oh, uh, that was a... Here at the Barclay Center, uh, a couple, maybe a year or so ago, but I just noticed both fighters were in fighting, uh, and you know when fighters put their heads on each other's shoulder, they're susceptible to getting hit with uppercuts. Um, so I just stayed on. I just kept focusing on their heads and watching, the, the, watching for uppercuts. And sure enough, this guy's head popped up um, from doing a lot of. Uh, they sit down on their punches, and they just uh, they just put their head on their shoulders, and you just know to look for that. Uh, I, I guess you just learn to, to look for that kind of yeah. stuff. And I guess you only see that in photographs, that face, right? Or could you actually see it? Yeah, he was beat it? up, that guy. Uh, yeah. well, well, uh, I hate to ask technical questions. What do you think your shutter speed was? Yeah, it? I know what it was. It was um, uh, 2,500 at F3.2. And we couldn't do that in the film days, but now, now you, could, you could really get away with it, definitely. ASA 4000, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> ASA uh, doesn't matter anymore. No, but it works. I mean, the, the, the cameras we use Thank now you, are... Canon. Yeah, oh, that's just after an MMA fight, a guy had a rough night, so... Oh, I guess I, at this stage, I should say, they all use Canons, and I didn't set Am up I allowed to say that? Yes, Canon okay. cameras are, are awesome. Yeah, they're awesome. Oh, this was a, uh, it's a spot at the U.S. Open. Um, it's a special spot. And it's going to go away, unfortunately, because they're uh, rebuilding the whole, the whole area of the U.S. Open with domes and everything else. But uh, I noticed, uh, Arani, every tennis player serves a certain way, whether they uh, bring the racket in front of their head, behind their head, and everybody has a way of where they put their hand. And I always noticed she served with her mouth open. Uh, and this goes back to just shooting tennis. And I thought, oh, she's on grandstand. Oh, it's sunny out. Oh, she's going to look up in the sky and she's going to open her mouth. I said, if I can just time it right, uh, I might get something out of it. And it worked and it worked and it worked. And I, I didn't get it the first day. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I was very upset because uh, I didn't think she'd be back on that court. Sure enough, two days later, they put her back on the court and I ran over there with just a little more concentration. I think I got too excited the first time. 
and I kept missing the racket. I kept clip, clipping it, or I couldn't get it in focus, one thing or the other. And then finally this one, so, okay. yeah. Um, well, we're going to have to move a little faster because I want sorry. to... Sorry. No, 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 I love every minute of it. It's my fault. Um, Simon, these pictures um, by you all are incredible vantage points, all surprising, nothing that, you know, somebody without your talent and experience could even get, in my opinion. Um, wow, I, thanks, girl. I mean, look at this. You're the first person that said that. <laughs> Ever. Ever. <laughs> I, I mean, the thing is, there. Yeah, just quickly, there. You know, overheads, and uh, you know, it's such a different perspective. Um, you know, I mean, anybody can take those pictures because it's they're just very different views, and I just got to be up there. So, um, you know, this is not a great uh, JPEG. This anybody could take too. It seems to me uh, that, that you one. really know how to overheads. focus. It, yeah, I mean, it goes back to that thing I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier about Sports Illustrated, you know, having the, giving you the latitude or the mm -hmm. luxury, mm -hmm. not just to get the winner crossing the line. Uh, Sports Illustrated had a photographer at the finish line, and I was basically wandering around trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, and, you know, they had a new, I mean, these are the things, you're just thinking of them on the go. Mm -hmm. And they had a new stand built near the finish, uh, near the start line, and I snuck up there and decided to use, mm -hmm. you know, the crowd and, and get them at the start when they're together. Yeah. And all of you photograph um, kids playing amateur sports. This is particularly lovely. Your website, you chose this to open your website. Yeah, I, was I, love really this I don't know why. I, was I, I love this photograph. Um, you know, I, I, it was in Africa this year. Um, it was in Zambia. And, uh, yeah, why mm -hmm. not? Why not? I mean, I'm photographing for myself, so why shouldn't I show what I like? <laughs> um, and this leads into John's series of street basketball. Um, kind of, um, let's, I'll go through them and you talk. I mean, again, beautiful shadows, beautiful forms. The, as we were talking about earlier, the whole street basketball where that all came from is that when I first started shooting um, sports for advertising, there really wasn't a whole lot of people shooting sports for advertising. Most of the, the stuff you saw um, was like a basketball player standing still on a basketball court with flames behind him. Um, it, it, or, or at my first um, time, I, uh, my first big name athlete I ever photographed was Larry Bird. <laughs> standing on a pedestal with his accomplishments under it, and it was a poster for Converse. So I started doing some work with Reebok, and um, Reebok wanted me to photograph their, their catalog of all their different clothing lines. And up until then, Reebok hired models. They went to modeling agencies, got a couple of people who were fit, and, and put them in their clothes. Um, I convinced them that they should use real athletes, people who actually run, people who actually pay, play basketball. And basketball was, was particularly hard to cast because you can't um, get high school guys because that will ruin eligibility for, for college. People who are playing in college don't want to do it because that could hurt their eligibility while they're in college. And that's the age range they're looking for. So the only place that we could find people to cast was um, street basketball players. And at the time, my knowledge of street basketball was fairly small. I knew about the record tournament every year that people had talked about it, I've seen some films about it. Um, so we bring in the basketball players, we shoot, the, we do a shoot, it was out at Venice Beach, was the first one we did at the basketball court at Venice Beach. And then after it was over, the sunlight was so beautiful and I have these incredible athletes in front of me and so I just did some portraits. And that, uh, I kept doing that, I was always doing that, and that turned into, um, I won an award in communication arts for it. Um, then that turned around, Nike saw it and hired me to do uh, a street basketball campaign for New York City and it was the first time that it was a strictly um, outdoor 
campaign. There was no print in any magazines whatsoever. These were in bus shelters, on subways, and they were only in the areas where kids played street basketball. Um, and it was such a successful campaign. Uh, and the reason we thought it was successful is that it was a honor if you could, or I don't know if it's an honor, but it, would be, it was a challenge for somebody to steal all 19 of the different ads. Like taking them out of the subways or taking them out of the, the, the bus places. Um, and so then um, Charlie Melcher approached me about doing a book and he, this, is, this is how this became um, what it was. And then, then I became, I learned all about street basketball in every city in, in the country and um, traveled to all these different cities. It took about five years to, to put it all together. Um, well, um, we're going to end with Walter, but I'm not going to end with Walter talking because I want to have time for questions. But after street basketball, I think um, I really wanted to put this, these, this guy with this guy in. Um, it's about a relationship. It's about trust. It's about great photography. Um. <laughs> By the way, my chair is collapsing here. <laughs> It's not, oh, gee, I guess that means the time is, <laughs> oh my God, it really it's is. A, I got a lot of crackling going on down here. <laughs> then it's best, <laughs> um, you know, we just saw street basketball, now we're seeing God's, he, he's falling through, we have to end pretty soon. Or if somebody could get another chair. Um, we need to go to like a warehouse. <laughs> Terrible. Um, and I do want to end because, you know, they were dreamers when they were this with teenagers, and now they're on the stage and they have, <laughs> they're still humble enough to fall through. <laughs> um, I, I do want to leave some question, time for questions. Um, how do you want to um, work this in the audience? Raise your hand if you want to ask a question, um, and then I will formally thank my round table errs, who's done such a great job, it made it so much easier than my nightmares last night. Um, is there a question? While we're waiting, everyone's invited to see the exhibition, courtesy of Canon. Um, we're very appreciative. There's normally a small charge, and they've bought tickets for all of you, and there'll be a book signing. And I want to. Do we have a question yet? Uh, okay, here we go. Okay. Hey, uh, uh, thanks so much for, for doing this. I'll, I'll admit I had no idea who the four of you were before tonight, but I've seen all of your photos. Uh, I'm just, I love sports and I like photography, so I thought this would be cool to come to. Uh, my question is, my greatest sports moment is seeing Aaron Boone's, uh, you know, 11th inning home run in the Game 7, 2003 ALCS. Uh, what's, what's your greatest moment that you ever got to witness, if you had to rank any of them? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> They may have seen I mean, you, I you are working, narrow it down so I mean, you should be focused uh, really on what's happening in front of you. I mean, only a few times have I felt something special happening in front of me and, and realized it. You know, maybe at the end of the game, you know, I've, I've talked to a writer or, and asked them, well, that was a really boring game. And he's like, that was the greatest game ever. <laughs> And when you're looking through a long lens, you know, you, you, you have a very, very different perspective to someone sitting in the bleachers with uh, a lot of beer. Can I add something to that? Because you don't see the game in many ways. A lot of times I had no idea what the score was because your whole life is through a 600 millimeter or a 400 millimeter. I mean, that was my first lens. So my whole life was edited out as a kid. And that's what you do. You edit out everything else is there. I mean, for me, uh, I'd have to say probably as a, as a New York Giants football fan, um, when they, I've never been able to go to a, I have, 
having gone to a Super Bowl where they've won or been except 2011. Uh, so as a fan and a photographer, uh, it, was, it was a special moment for me uh, because <laughs> While they were celebrating, I was calling my, I, mean, I shouldn't say this, but I was calling my father from the field and just going, Dad, we did it, we did it. <laughs> and then what's funny is Victor Cruz did this documentary on Showtime, and uh, you could see after he won, he was making his way to the podium, and, and there I am in the background on my phone <laughs> going, Dad, we did it, we did it, when I should have been taking some pictures. But it was quick, and, and uh, but I have, I, I say, I, did a phone video um, of the TV because I, I laughed and I sent it to him, and uh, it's one it's a bond between father and son I think that is uh, that that at least drew me uh, you know away from concentrating on the game, which Simon is right. I mean, it's probably the only time I, I stepped away from myself as a as a doing a job as opposed to turning into a fan. Good answers. Another question. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Um, as we look through your, uh, your repertoire, it strikes me that the photos you take are a cross of um, action shots, portraiture, photojournalism. How do you each balance that when you're at an event? Um, these are all different perspectives and have different priorities. How are you balancing that when you're on the field? Well, I mean, each assignment's different. I mean, if you're assigned to do action, you're probably not doing portraits. If you have a portrait assignment, you don't have to worry about the action so much. Um, we've all done something called the action portrait, which, you know, it's when you control the athlete. My goal was always to get the athlete in a place where you want them, in the light where you want them, where you have control of what they do for maybe 10 minutes. But everything is set up in advance. And this is what we've all done, and this is, I mean, that's my favorite thing to do. And, and for me, and I, I won't speak for these gentlemen, but the, the one thing that all those different things have in, have in common is they're all photographs. And I don't look at, if, I, if I'm shooting at the Olympics, I'm shooting an action shot, but if I see somebody sitting quietly reflecting, I'm gonna do a portrait of that. I always say if I can get the athlete to look at me, that's, it's a portrait. But it's not something for me that I, I consciously switch back and forth from. It's, I'm a photographer, I'm taking pictures. That's what it is to me. I mean, I like the variety. Uh, you know, I get pretty bored doing the same thing over and over again. So the ability to change and do a portrait is a very different skill to actually, you know, shooting action on the sideline. So I love, I love that variety. It keeps me a little bit more, it keeps me sharp. Yeah, it's the same for me. Um, I feel that, I, I mean, who I work for, I work for, for Getty Images. You, you got to wear a lot of hats, uh, actually, and juggle. It's a constant juggling act of keeping uh, clients happy with following a story. And, you know, you might have a list of some things you got to do, and then also trying to, to get these kind of pictures on the screen. Um, so it's what presents itself, you know, um, and following the story a little bit from, from where I'm coming from. If it's a tough game and the quarterback's having a really tough game and he threw three interceptions, well, part of the story is him being depressed on the sideline or sitting by himself on the bench or, you know, it's just, so that's what drives me a little bit to go from doing action to portraits on the sideline or a commercial job as well. It's a, it's a nice step on the brakes kind of thing where you can, um, you know, if you miss the picture, you can go, well, could you do that again? You know, so all, most of these, act, all, all these action shots, you can't just go, oh, could you do that again? Um, some pictures are repetitive, like tennis, but you can never get that one shot again. You only get one shot when you shoot in action, so. Another yeah, I have, a, I have one more question. Um, so obviously the athletes and their skills are usually larger than life. The situations are also larger than life. And so that leads to a lot of um, very heroic pictures, um, the way the athletes are portrayed. But now when you see um, with the big scandals in sports going on with like the doping and um, you know, there are so many aspects where you can see now a darker side and um, which is also part of life. 
is there a way that you change your visual approach to portray this complexity when you, when you cover these major events? I, I would say not unless you're doing a story on if someone has sent you out to do drugs and sports, which no one's going to send you out to do, <laughs> because no one's going to advertise it. I mean, listen, there's drugs or scandals in every world. I mean, put yourself in an athlete's shoes. You're 23, 24, you've got a $10 million contract, everyone's throwing everything at you. I mean, it's only human you're going to do things when you're young that you may regret at 35. And the athletes of 10 or 15 years ago, say Jordan, before the, the internet took over, he may have changed the way he lived because everything's public now. It's, it's just a different world. You have to be very careful, I think. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm always sensitive to the athlete. I mean, part of the reason I'm there is because of the athlete. So, I mean, I, I'm always aware, you know, if they're doing something on the sideline, I'm photographing it. I'm photographing it, you know? And if he's injecting himself with a large syringe, that's a great photograph. <laughs> <laughs> um, Will it I'm be not, published? I'm not going out of my way. I'm never going out of my way to disparage any of the athletes. I mean, as I said, you know, the hard work they put in is, is pretty amazing to see, so. We probably have time for just one or two more. Okay. As a okay. photographer, um, what do you call, or to you guys, what is a perfect picture if there is such a thing to you? And if there is such a thing to you, how do you find it in all of your photos? Like, say, let's say you're doing an event, how do you find that perfect picture? I, I, for me, the perfect picture is the next one. Still looking for it. I, don't, I can't answer that. Still, still looking for it. Walter took it. <laughs> talk, talk, talk to this guy. Now, I think there's one thing that we've sort of glossed over in this whole thing, that all these wonderful pictures you've seen tonight I deal with light. And every great picture starts with light, if you have a chance to do it. I mean... 90% of these pictures with the shadows, with the lights, have all been special because of what's been brought there, whether it's natural light or whether you strobe it, because it's always about the same thing, light. Well, my question had to do with, particularly with boxing and, and the access and the space that's available and how, uh, how especially for you know, a high-profile event like the Pacquiao fight, how the pecking order is established and uh, how the, the boxing management controls it or, the, or the, the publications, and if you could speak on that subject, and also how you deal with each other if, if you give somebody space or you, you, you know, elbow somebody out of the way. And I guess following up on that, is there any examples of sports where access is very, very restricted that you wouldn't think of, that you wouldn't think of as a fan? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's restricted in, in pretty much every sport because uh, if they let everybody in, there'd be no room. I, it goes according to, I guess, order of, um, I guess, what's important to, how do you say it, Simon? Like, it, it's just, uh, if it's a small, small weekly paper as opposed to Sports Illustrated or a big agency, you know, the small paper is going to lose out. If it's on a boxing ring, let's say, there's only so many positions you could get. As far as elbowing or pushing people out of the way, you know, you want to be treated, um, you treat people the way you want to be treated, you know, and of course we're all, it's a very physical thing that we do, and you do get, you know, you bump into each other, but as far as I'm concerned, from this end, it's never intentional um, unless someone inflicts something upon me, which has happened, and, um, you know, then you deal with it, but uh, the, the, my intent, I, and most of my friends who I work with, their intent is not to, to harm the person next to them. You know, we, we need to work together. Uh, it's a very small circle of sports photographers out there. Uh, you'll see each other all over the country and all over the world. And, you know, if you get that reputation as, as um, a, a kind of a jerk, then no one's going to want to help you out. You know, if you need that uh, extra battery that ran out or if, you know, your camera went down and, you know, you're stuck on a ski mountain, 
because, you know, if you're a jerk, no one's going to want to help you. So it's just basic, the basic rules. You treat people as you want to be treated, I think. Say please and thank you. And um, it's real simple, you know. And then going back to what Walter said on that other question, yeah, light, composition, background. I mean, those are three things that constantly swirl in my head when, uh, when I'm out there trying to shoot somebody or something, you know. So that's... Uh, so. I mean, I think the boxing is a slightly different game to everything else. There's always a way to getting ringside to shoot it. You know, there's always a back door. The promoter wants the guy. Somebody knows of somebody else. You know, that's how boxing has always been a little bit shady, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, you well. know, but I mean, just to reiterate what Al said, I mean, working with other sports photographers, you know, you, it gets a little heated. But you never know when you need a spare battery, as Al said. Well, we're going to have to wrap this up. I am so thrilled that um, we ended by talking about capturing light as well as capturing sports, capturing, you know, players, because these are four amazing photographers, and photographers is at the heart of photography is light, and. Thank you, thank you, um, Photo Brigade, for live streaming this and putting it on all kinds of out there. So no matter how many people are in the audience, and you were wonderful, and I thank you again for coming out. You know, many, many more people will be listening and watching this. Um, thank you for Adoram Adorama. You know, it's a worldwide community of photographers. They helped sponsor it. And thank you very much for, to Canon, and they do all use Canons, um, for making it possible for everybody in this room to go up and see the exhibition. And if you're interested in buying the book, I'm happy to sign it. So thank you so much. We, I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>